chapter 5, verse 22 of the great book of Deuteronomy. Ella had abarin. These are the words. That's the Hebrew title for the book of Deuteronomy. They're God's words. They're important to you if you seek his blessings. Many people wonder why their prayers are not answered. you got to do the ifs. God says, I promise you, if you do this, that, or the other, I will bless you. You can count on it. Uh, if you don't do the ifs, then you have no business asking, really, because he has suggested, warned, pleaded, time after time, listen to me and see how it's done. So, Had um, Abarim tells you how. That's what these words are about. Not for someone just to read, but telling you how to find peace of mind, be successful and have happiness in this world. That's pretty important. Do you know that God wants you to be happy? He certainly does. Chapter 5, verse 22, a word of wisdom from Yeshua, and it reads, These words, there it is again, had a barim. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thick darkness. This was at Mount Sinai when God spoke to the children and frightened them with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. And within these tables of stone, the first five being spiritual, the second five being civil. It tells you how to get along spiritually and how to get along civilly, that is to say, with your neighbors, governments, and so forth. You just can't go wrong. Now, are we all going to be perfect and do that? There are many other ordinances aside from that. But that's the ten words, so to speak. Ten main words. God himself wrote them. Verse 23. And it came to pass when ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders, they all flooded right up to me, Moses, that is to say, 24. And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God has showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. What they're leading up to here is, Moses, it really frightened us. We'd about as soon you'd be the one to go up the mountain and let him talk to you, and then you come back down and tell us what he said. Uh, they, that's typical of people once the presence strikes them. And certainly when he spoke from that fire and that voice boomed down into that valley below, it got their attention. They knew then that God does speak. I want you to make a mental note of that. There were thousands of witnesses that heard God speak, so don't you ever doubt there is a God. That is so, uh, so kindergarten-ish for someone to doubt that there is a Father if you lived any time at all and have tasted of his wonderful blessings, his creation, his word. I mean, there were thousands of witnesses that day, not just Moses, but all of them that heard him speak. It kind of it put the fear of God into them, as I stated in the last lecture, verse 25. Now, therefore, why should we die, question? That's showing you how they were terrified. God is not out to zap people. He's out to give life, not to kill his children. He loves them. So that shows you how men's minds can be twisted so easily. For this great fire will consume us. Uh, if we hear the voice of, our, uh, of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. They really believe that, I think. Of course, there was the old cliche that I have told you, shared with you, that it was believed that if anyone were to talk to God face to face, they would die. Well, that just isn't true. It simply is the fact that 
in the spiritual body, when you're in your spiritual body, you can see him face to face, and you must die to do that, to accomplish it. It's a statement that is after the fact. Verse 26, For who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Who's done that? Well, they seem to have made it pretty good one time. They just don't want to try it again. People are strange. You know, to be that close to our Father and then to shun Him shows how immature a majority's minds can be. And, and that's really sad. It really is sad. But that's God's children. God knows it. Today, you can speak these words and out of the population of five billion in the world at this time, a pittance of that five billion really want to hear these words. I'm glad you do, but most of all, your father's glad that you do. Verse 27, go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. <laughs> Words, words, words. Man's words many times say if they were kept, it would be wonderful. But do you think they did? Of course they didn't. You, you know the story as well as I do. After he spoke, Moses brought down the tables, and you know what happened, what they were doing at the bottom of the mount. 28. And the Lord heard the voice of your words. He heard your promise. You think he doesn't hear your promises today? When ye spake unto me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee, they have well said all that they have spoken. It pleased him. It pleased him to hear it. It pleases him to hear from you. But it pleases him a lot more when you keep your word. 29. Oh, that there were such an heart in them. You see, you don't con God. That's a mind. Heart is the mind. That they would fear me, that's to revere me, love me, and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Forever means even to this day, and that is the word of God. Now, Why do you think God brought forth um, the keeping of commandments? Do you think it was to make you uncomfortable? Do you think it was to make life hard? Do you think it was to throw stumbling blocks in your path? No. For the Father makes it very clear that the reason I do this is that it might be well with them. He cares. Naturally, if they obey his commandments, then they don't have the troubles in the world. You see, man brings troubles on himself. God doesn't bring him troubles. Man, by not obeying the commandments, abridges other people's rights, and naturally somebody's going to get uh, a little bitter about it. That's just the way life is. If you obey God's commandments, you most likely will not make anyone else bitter unless they're a little bit off, unless maybe their elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. I mean, you've always got nuts that will argue even with the Word of God. But uh, the majority of the people, God cares. He, may, he gave the commandments to tell you how to find peace, that it might be well with you and your children forever. Don't forget to share it with your children, all right? That's important. Raise a child up in the Word, and he, he may drift here and he may drift there, but he'll never depart totally from it. It's always in his mind. 30, continuing. Go say to them, get you into your tents again. In other words, he's going to do a little shuffling here. He heard him say, they don't want to hear me talk. Just tell them to get in their tents. Get out of sight. 31, but as for thee, God speaking to Moses, stand thou here by me, and I will speak unto thee all the commandments, you got it, one, and the statutes, 
two, and the judgments, three, which thou shalt teach them that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess it. Now, God didn't break this up into three parts about one thing. And if you're going to be a teacher, you must teach all three parts. The commandments basically cover the spiritual, which is also the moral commandments. The statutes cover the... Now, listen to this carefully. This is important, and it'll help you understand our Father's words, especially the penitent. That is to say, the law, the Torah. Uh, the commandments being that that is moral or probably better said spiritual. And statutes cover the rituals. And many of the, what does a ritual do? It sets forth the type that God is teaching by using object lessons for people like the sacrificing of animals. That ritual was done away with when Christ was nailed to the cross. And that's why it's important for you to keep them separate. And the judgments, and of course, the judgments are cover the civil. And then you have to break each of those three. Let's take the judgments. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this because it's a different subject for a different time. And if you ever want to make a study of the law, I have two cassette tapes that explain very clearly and in detail the difference in those three. And it's important because uh, you don't know which have been fulfilled and which and how to do them if you don't have a pretty good working knowledge of why God would do it in the first place. So let's, we'll continue with judgments. Judgments covers both uh, punishment and duties. Your duty is a judgment. And you must consider it so. What do you mean, my duties? Well, if you're one of God's elect, he's filled the New Testament as well as the Old with what your duties are. Do you do them? And you might say, well, give us an example. I'd be happy to. If it will simplify it, let's do. Mark chapter 13 stipulates that all those that have eyes to see and ears to hear that is to say that know that the false Christ is coming first before anybody gathers back to Jesus, that they will be delivered up, and they're not to premeditate what they will say beforehand. So they pray for the will, wisdom and the knowledge, and they know that it is their destiny to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them. That's a judgment. It was a judgment when God made the judgment, even in the first earth age, and a lot of people are going to say, what's he talking about? Well, if you don't understand, put it on the shelf, and then continue studying, and it will come to you. Those that he chose before the foundations of this earth. It was his judgment that they would be the election of this generation. Thus, judgment is your duties. Now, to those that disobey, judgment is their punishment. So do you see there's a great difference between the three and it's the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. And it's important. Uh, you, could, you could funnel them all under law if you wanted to, but it would be a little bit incorrect. But be that as it may, there don't, the main thing, and it would be dangerous, is not to keep the three separated in your mind as you study God's Word, for they are written in three separate ways. So knowing the division, you have a better understanding and clarity of our Father's word. Verse 32, ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right hand or the left. And this is, this is what's wrong with our, uh, maybe I'm spending a little more time than I should, but I feel it's necessary. You're not to turn to the right or the left for men. If God's word says it, it is straight on. It is yea or it is nay. That is it. There is nothing else to say about it. That settles it. Now, what does man do today? Well, man today in judgments lives under the law of precedence. And men and women go to law school for years and years 
not really learning the law, but learning the precedence. And basically, law is argued today not by what is right or wrong. Now, some would be offended by that, but nevertheless, I feel it's true. Not by what is right or wrong or honest, neither the left nor the right, but whoever can dig up the most precedence where some judge in the past has decided it should be a certain way. Not, be, not because of the way the law itself reads. Now, I don't know about you, but I resent that. I resent that our law system, our judicial system of today is a law of precedence. Well, you want it all decided all over again? And we'd be a lot better off if it was, if it was just stuck to the law. Let the Constitution be the base thereof and go into the, we are to obey all civil laws if it, unless it uh, uh, bridges uh, so, uh, our serving God. And let the precedents hang themselves because many of them were bad judgments and have proved themselves to be anyway. Read the law the way it's written and live by it. With, uh, naturally, with the jury of your peers, they know what's right and wrong and so forth. If the real true law is placed forth, it's neither right nor left. It's straight on. It's a simple case. Now, well, I just, I feel much better. I hope you do too. Law of precedence, I detest. Verse uh, 33, I believe we got to, okay? Verse 33, and it reads, Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you. Now, what is it he wants you to do? He wants you to walk the way he has commanded you. How? Tell me. Pray, tell me. How can you know how to walk by his commandments if you've never studied the commandment? There is no way you can please God and be blessed if that is your lot. So do something about it. Get into his word, hadabarim, and enjoy it, and be blessed. And be a help to your community and your family. That ye may live. Ultimately, that's the outcome, is you can gain eternal life or you can go to hell. It's the choice is strictly yours, and you can't blame anyone else. And that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. And, of course, Father, Father was setting that wonderful land forth, and Father did create a wonderful world here. If you don't mess it up, we've got nice oxygen. Oh, you could just pull it in and breathe it, unless you live in a place where people kind of go around poisoning each other legally um, with uh, uh, too much, uh, too many gases from uh, automobile exhaust and so forth. Don't, don't try to blame that on God. We've done it to ourselves, all right? And, uh, but anyway, God... The point I want to make, God has made it easy for you, and he has blessed you, and he has told you how to be successful. Quite frankly, you might say, well, how can they help but breathe poison gas? Well, let's see now. Duh, how can we arrange that? Well, go somewhere where there's not poisonous gas. Oh, I got it. Click on that. This makes sense, doesn't it? Well, things are pretty simple if you stay away from precedence and set yourself in a box that has li a lid on it, and your world becomes pretty small. We have a wonderful place that God has created. Take care of it, and he will bless you. I know there are always extenuating circumstances, and God created these bodies where they adapt quite handily to most conditions. But anyway, man's choice, I, I suppose the point I'm trying to make it's your choice. God has given us a free nation here. And there is no decree that you must stay wherever where you're not comfortable, not wanted, not happy. All right? You, it, you live under a law, constitution, that gives you the right 
to do whatever you are capable of doing as long as it with, is within the parameters of that law, not right or left, but by it you won't go wrong. All right? And however you make your life, it's your choice. <clears throat> Maybe some of you have listened way too long to some of the an advice from lawyers that set uh, judgment by precedent. And I'm not telling, I'm not trying to tell you if you ever need legal advice, at least find a Christian that teaches legal advice. And, and that's not necessarily a preacher. I'm talking about a Christian lawyer, and maybe you'll do better. But anyway, your main law comes from God. And don't ever forget it. God can, you see, the beauty of being a Christian is that it doesn't matter all that much what the precedents say. It doesn't matter all that much. But if God has his hand upon you, he can change the minds of jurors. God can do that. He can do it in your favor. All things happen for a purpose. Think about it. Pray about it. We're in charge, all right? It's just really quite that simple. We're in charge. Why? Because God's our Father, and He's the head kingpin. He only allows things to happen in this world. So think about it, believe it, act upon it, and have the faith to operate under those conditions, and you'll be a can-do type person. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. Th these are your rights, your privileges, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. In other words, if you don't do them, you're not going to possess it. Somebody's going to beat you out of it. It's the same way with your paycheck. If you don't do it God's way, don't worry. Somebody will probably beat you out of it anyway. Verse 2 that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, that you might love him, revere him. Check the word fear out in your Strong's Concordance and prove me wrong that it doesn't, it can be translated revere as well as fear. And we do revere our Father. How can you help it with all these promises when his best wish is not to zap you, but that it might be well with you? That's his wish. Okay. To, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, Moses speaking to them, going to lay it on you here. This was done at uh, Passover. Thou and thy son and thy son's son. That means even to this day. All the days of thy life that, and that, that thy days may be prolonged. That's a promise. You got it? God says you'll live longer and your days will be prolonged in protecting this land that I give you and finding happiness there if what? If you teach God's commandments, judgments, and statutes. You can have a lot better life. Verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. The word observe, I would, I would rather translate it, you take heed that it may be well with thee. Do you want it to be well with you or do you like a hard life of hardship? I don't know. The choice is yours. And that you may increase mightily. Do, do you just like to get by or would you like to increase mightily? It's God's promise. What are you going to do about it? If I were you, I'd claim it. As the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Well, that means there's plenty of everything there. I guess my question would be, do you have your part? You know, a lot of people come along later with an atheistic, communistic view that everybody should just divide up equal everything and throw God out. But yet at the same time, God provided the land. It's no accident that our Constitution was taken from the Holy Word of God, that it protects you when you know your business, that you can multiply mightily if you so choose. Listen very carefully. Be sharp for me in this next verse, verse 4, and the explanation I will give following. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is an acrostic within this. Um, the first word in the manuscripts, understand I'm speaking Hebrew now, in the manuscripts is Shema. And the last word in that line is Ikad. And the last letter of Shema, E, and of Ikad gives E-D. These in the manuscripts are muscular letters, which simply means they're bigger than the others, to draw attention to it. And what does it mean? Well, E-D means witnesses. You can witness it. That God wanted you to know that, that you can witness the fact that the Lord our God is one, uno. Itchy. And on we could go into many languages. One, Lord. One, Yahweh. So, uh, in serving him, uh, it'd be pretty difficult to be confused and think some car was Lord or that your home was Lord. That means you let it come between you and Lord. It's, it's uh, so... Uh, you, you just enjoy being there so much. Now, you should enjoy your home, but don't worship it. You're, you know what? Your father created the brick and the timber, that is to say the rock that is in the mortar or whatever the case may be, even the iron that makes the nails. He created all that stuff. So you don't worship something God created. You worship him. He is one Yahweh, one living God. He is that he is, so don't look anywhere else. Stay with him. What he's saying here, there's only one, and there's only one set of commandments. Now, the commandments consist of three, yes, but there's only one. Uh, and that is the word, these words, being the words of the only one Lord. That's important, and the acrostic is placed there for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. You with companion Bibles are very fortunate. It'll take you into depth on that subject. Verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Can you do that? You know, uh, you know what your uh, heart, that's to say your mind, don't, don't get something else in your mind. And your soul is your very being, whether it's in the flesh body or a spiritual body. And you do it with all your might. Uh, Jesus would put it in a little different way when he would quote it. Well, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go to, to Matthew 22 in the New Testament. Many people think, we well, they're reading that Old Testament again. There's no such thing, really, as the Old Testament. God's Word is forever. And uh, being forever, Jesus being the living Word, well, certainly um, uh, we have within that his advice. His, uh, in verse 37 of chapter 22 of the great book of Matthew, 37, what is it going to say? Well, I don't know. Let's read it. New Testament, Matthew 22, verse 37. You're not going to have it on the generator? Fine. Use your Bible. you got one, haven't you? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Meaning, that's your might, is your mind. How, how big is your mind? That's how much your might is. All right? Basically, don't take that as an insult. It's a fact. If your mind is small in God's Word, enlarge it. That's up to you. It's your fault if it's small. 38. This is the first and great commandment. It's the spiritual commandment. Right? What? To love the Lord with all your mind, with all your, with all your heart. That is to say, your faith, your loyalty, and so forth. You want Him to touch you. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And these, on these two commandments 
hang all the law and the prophets. It's true. I, I do that to show you it will keep you out of trouble. It's the, mo it's the main thing. It's the main ingredient in the pie of life that you hang on to it, that you live it. It's not a religion. It's a reality. Returning then to, to um, verse 6 of uh, the great uh, chapter 6 of, Gen of uh, Deuteronomy. And these words, there's that barim again, which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. That's to say in your mind. Keep those things in your mind if you wish to be blessed. Verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. It's a good subject. Discuss it. Reason with each other. And when thou walkest by the way, that's mean when you're traveling, you discuss the word. And when thou liest down, think about them, meditate on these words. And when thou riseth up, when you're planning your new day, think on the word. What would God think about this? What does God's word say about this? Would God's word prevent me from doing this? Well, that old word just prevents you from doing any. No, it prevents you from getting into trouble. It prevents you from losing money. It prevents you from uh, losing a child, necessarily. That is to say, away from your wisdom, because the child will respect your wisdom, whereby that child will follow one that teaches with wisdom. And true wisdom comes from God. True wisdom comes from these words. That's why God blesses his children, those that follow that word. Let's take one more verse, and we'll conclude this lecture then. Verse 8. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And I'm going to have to go a little further, and then I'll explain this, and then we'll stop. 9, and thou shalt write them up on the post of thy house and um, on thy gates. What's it talking about? What's between your eyes in its frontlet? Is your brain is right in there. Write them in your mind. That's why he said meditate on them day and night. We have some people that will write the scriptures Hadabarim and so forth and wad it up and plait it in their hair. What good is that going to do? If you ever have a moment of stress, you're going to take time to unbrat your hair and pull out the little thing and read it and so on and so forth. It's so much easier just to memorize it, to keep it inside, locked right away there, where by meditating on it, you call it the mind. Well, what about the hand? Do it. That's what you use your hands for is to do things. But many people make a religion out of this, a writing down, and, and, and hey, I don't, I don't have any quarrel with it. If they want to do that, that suits me fine. But I want you to know that this teacher knows it's talking about your brain because that is the subject, is what you keep in your mind and keep God's word there. That's the point. And the post of your house, what is that? What was the post? The post was the, the gate or so forth, meaning judgment itself. Keep the, keep the commandments in your house. Do, do, by that I mean, let the law of God be the law of your home, and you'll have a lot happier home. Now, you can, you can put the whole word right by the doorpost, and, and you can chain it right there by the doorpost. Or you can put the whole word under your hat it's not going to do you any good unless you've got it in here, okay? Understand what I'm saying. You know, it's uh, people take figures of speech and the Hebrew idioms, and they sure make funny ways. They make a religion rather than a reality of how God tells you. You see, in times of emergency, you don't have time to read something to find a way out. You've got to be able to decide like that, and God will give you a mind that will do that for you if 
you will place it in your frontlets. And it's not talking about your fuzzy head. And by that I mean your hair. Some people have fuzzy hair and some don't, be that as it may. <clears throat> well, some people are lucky and some people are not. 